this weekend there was a, a very important game that was played, at least important in my house. Uh, I went to Oklahoma State University. I'm a cowboy. My wife went to the University of Arkansas. I don't want to say she's a pig, but uh, she's a Razorback. I'm a cowboy. She's a Razorback. And so this is the first time in a very long time that the two teams have played each other. And, uh, you know, when we heard that the game was going to be played, we immediately thought, we've got to get tickets. Like, we need to go to that game. It's going to be a great game. We'll get to hopefully have a good time together and not be at each other as the, the game goes on. Um, but there was a problem. Uh, pretty much the moment that the tickets were released, they were sold out. And so we started looking, you know, secondary market, trying to find tickets. And the only tickets we could find were $200. And y'all, I love football. I love Oklahoma State. And I really love my wife. Uh, but I don't want to spend $200 to watch Oklahoma State play football with my wife. You know, just kind of out of the budget. But just bear with me for a minute. Let's just pretend that this weekend, uh, my wife and I spent $400, drove to Stillwater, went to the game, watched all the festivities. Um, now, it would have been a good day, no, no question about it. But I want you to think about that ticket that I would have paid, well, those two tickets, I would have paid $400 for. Um, those tickets were really important because they would have got us into the game, right? Critical piece if you're going to attend, you've got to have a ticket. But what is that ticket worth the moment that it's scanned and I enter into the stadium? Nothing. It's only valuable to the extent that it, that it gets me in the door, right? Like that's why we want a ticket. And then I wad it up or throw it away or something. Many people treat the gospel of Jesus Christ the very same way. They think of the gospel as the ticket that gets their, their foot in the door of Christianity. I've, I've now got my seat secured in heaven, and so I don't really need to think about the gospel anymore. I, I, I've prayed the prayer. I've walked the aisle. I've come to faith in Jesus. I've, I've, I've uh, announced that through baptism. What's the gospel even relevant for anymore? Well, the whole point of my sermon today, the thing that you're going to hear me say over and over and over again, is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we should not just believe the gospel. We have to live the gospel. Uh, J.D. Greer, a, a guy, a pastor that I, I listen to, he says the gospel is not the diving board. It's not the thing that we kind of are jumping off point, and now we're Christians and we begin this faith apart from the gospel. He says the gospel isn't the diving board, it's the pool. It is the, the environment in which we live as Christians. It's the, it is the surroundings. It is our context that we live out the Christian life in this world. That is the gospel. It's not just our ticket to get in, but rather the gospel is what we should strive to live out each and every day. Now what we're going to see in the text is an example of the Apostle Peter losing sight of the gospel and the consequences that come with that. You're probably going to um, feel it a bit because we've all been there. Now if you weren't with us the last few weeks, uh, certainly last week, you know that the Apostle Paul, he was being a peacemaker, right? He's being a peacemaker among the Galatian churches. And so he's gone up to Jerusalem. He's laid out his, his gospel before the, the apostles so that they might kind of put their stamp of approval on it and say, yes, indeed, Paul, you are a true apostle and you are preaching the true gospel. So, so Paul did this, um, went up laid out his gospel, and they affirmed it completely. They didn't add a single thing to it. It was this big, beautiful scene where uh, Peter and James and John, they extend the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul. And they're like, you're the, God, or you're the apostle to the Gentiles, just like we are the apostles to the Jews. And so, it, you know, they're high-fiving and pumping each other up. And you would think that after all of that, that the, it would kind of be um, the, the end of the story would conclude with, and they lived happily ever after, right? Because because that's how it should have been. Everybody's on the same page. We're clear about what the gospel is and is not. But that's not the way it ended at all. As a matter of fact, something profound happened between chapter 2, verse 10, where we left off last week, and chapter 2, verse 11, where we're going to pick up this week. Something significant happened in Peter's life that the Apostle Paul, where just you know one verse before, right hand of fellowship, they're all together. Paul is now going to confront Peter for his hypocrisy. So if you have your Bibles, 
turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And what I want to do today is just walk through these verses and show you how important it is that we live out, not merely believe, but we live out the gospel in the context of our everyday lives. So I'm going to read for you a bit here in Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. It says this, But when Cephas, this is Peter, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. I told you it was a pretty big change, right? Things had happened between Jerusalem and Antioch. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like a Jew? What, what Paul is, is, is saying to Peter here is, hey, Peter, I, I've, I've saw you before. Like, I know the life that you've been living. I don't know if you're familiar with a vision that, that Peter had. You can go back, I think it's Acts chapter 10, where uh, Peter has a vision. And it's this, this giant sheep being lowered from heaven. And it's got all sorts of unclean animals. They're unclean according to Old Testament law. And the repeated command to Peter is, arise, kill, and eat. It's every hunter's favorite passage, right? Uh, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And he's like, hey, um, I can't do that. I'm a good Jew. I've never eaten anything unclean. Three times, arise, kill, and eat. And, and what God was demonstrating and communicating to Peter in that dream were the things that the Old Testament law had declared unclean should no longer be considered unclean because of the gospel of Jesus, right? He had made them clean. So Peter knew this. And yet... He's at one point, he's eating with the, the Gentiles at Antioch. They're sharing fellowship together. They're worshiping together. They're, they're doing the Lord's Supper together. They're living life together. Everything's good. It's uh, bacon for breakfast and pork chops for dinner, right? Peter is living in his freedom that comes from the gospel. But something happened that changed the way that Peter was living. Rather than living in the freedom that we have in the gospel, he returned back and began to live according to the Old Testament law, and he did so because of fear. We're told in the text he feared the circumcision party. Some men, um, the circumcision party, they would follow Paul around to the various places where he was preaching and in teaching. And so Paul would lay out the, the gospel. We are saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone, right? He would, he would preach that. And then the, the circumcision party would follow Paul along and be like, yeah, we are saved by faith in Jesus, but you also need to become a good Jew. You also need to observe the Old Testament law. You've got to cut the pork out. You've got to observe feasts and fe festivals, honor the Sabbath. Uh, they began to impose the Old Testament law on them. And Peter, who knew the gospel, who understood it, who had affirmed it with Paul in Jerusalem, he failed to, to live out the gospel. He failed to practice it. And he began to back away and he began to uh, separate himself from the Gentiles who were not Jews. And it caused a rift in the church in Antioch. The apostle Paul sees this and he begins to call Peter out for his hypocrisy. Now, um, oftentimes when we think about hypocrisy, uh, we think about, well, it's, you've heard it said, right? Everybody in the church, they're just a bunch of hypocrites, right? And kind of the, the understanding there is that we say one thing and we do another. We, we would hold people to one standard, but we ultimately live according to another standard. But a hypocrite in ancient literature, uh, it really meant to conceal one's true character. It was, it was used as a term of people who were actors or people that wore masks and would act in plays. And so um, the word used, it meant uh, to conceal someone's true character, to mask one's true convictions and to play a part that wasn't really theirs. Peter, in understanding the freedom that he had in the gospel, that we're no longer bound by the old covenant because Jesus has, uh, had ushered in a new covenant, 
he began to play the role of a hypocrite doing something outwardly that he didn't really believe to be true inwardly, and he did so for fear of the circumcision party. It seems that Peter had reverted back to his old identity, and Paul's going to call that out. Look here in verse 16. Paul reminds Peter of who they used to be. He said, we ourselves are Jews by birth. We are the people, uh, if you go back to Genesis, God called Abraham out from among his people and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to be their God and they're going to be my people. I'm going to distinguish you among all the nations. And, And God did indeed do that. With the nation of Israel, he ended up introducing the Mosaic Covenant. That's Weird word, I know, but it's it's the Old Testament law. If you read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you see that God called his people to live according to the law. And he did so for three reasons. The first reason uh, or that the law existed was that the law demonstrated the holiness of God. Uh, Because God is holy, uh, what the law said was we didn't just get to come to God haphazardly. Like the Israelites couldn't couldn't just stroll into the tabernacle, offer some worship. Like that is not how it went at all. Instead, there were about 600 laws in the Old Testament that all had to be observed. If you wanted to go into worship God, you had to be clean. You had to come in holiness because God himself is holy. They didn't treat God as something common or something unclean. He was holy. Holy. So that's the first purpose of the law. It demonstrated God's holiness. The second purpose of the law was that it demonstrated man's sinfulness. Go read Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And what you're going to find are laws that seem to govern things that you cannot fathom why they would even matter. You're going to, like, laws that govern the types of fabrics that you wear, the kinds of foods that you could eat, what you could touch and what you couldn't touch, all sorts of things that would make you, would make you unclean and therefore unfit for worship. If you touch something unclean or even you touch someone who was unclean, you could not come to worship. And so they would have cared about that. They were worshipers of God. He was their God. They were his people. And yet they would sin. Inevitably, you would do something that would make you unclean and unfit for worship. The law demonstrated the holiness of God, but it also demonstrated the sinfulness of men. And then the third thing that the law demonstrated was that sinful men need a Savior if they're going to have fellowship with a holy God. Now, there was a little functional piece of the law that said um, here's how when you become unclean you can be made clean and so they would have to undergo ceremonial washings of their person and of their garments and of the utensils that would be used in the tabernacle or later the temple so there was the washing and then they always had to come in with a prescribed sacrifice if sinful men were going to come to God it required that a blood sacrifice would be made The law demonstrated the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man and of our need for a Savior if we were going to be able to come into God to worship Him and have a relationship with Him. That's the Old Testament law. That's how Paul and Peter were raised in observance of the law. It was their whole life. 600 laws govern a lot of things. But that was their old life. And that was the old covenant. If you, if you know the story of the gospel, God did indeed send a savior. His name was Jesus. And Jesus came to earth and he lived a perfect sinless life. He kept the law at every single point. He upheld every condition of the law. He didn't sin uh, by committing any act that he shouldn't have. He didn't uh, fail to do all of the things that he should have. Jesus upheld the whole law perfectly. And then Jesus Christ went to the cross. And there on the cross, he shed his blood, offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And the way that we receive that the atonement, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, the way that we receive uh, the gospel, if you will, is, is simply through faith. Through faith, we enter into the grace of Jesus Christ. Whereas before, we were under the law. And the law told us how sinful we were, how holy God is. It showed us of our, the distance between us and God. The gospel tells us something different. 
rather than looking at how faithful we are to the law, we look now to how faithful Jesus was to the law. And we put our faith and trust in him and his faithfulness and not in ours. And now, as a result of the gospel, we get to stand in his grace alone. Our standing is in the grace of God. So back to the text. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Man, do you remember who you used to be, Peter? And you're the guy that, that kept the law. And you looked out on all the other peoples who were non-Jews, who didn't keep the law. And you saw them as unclean. They were filthy sinners, literally, right? That's how the Jews would have viewed the Gentiles. They couldn't share meals together because it would have made them unclean to even have fellowship with the Gentiles. And besides, Gentiles ate things that you weren't supposed to eat. Like, there was this separation. And Paul's like, hey, Peter, that's the old way. Like, that's who we used to be. But then he's going to remind them of this really important word called justification. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. He says the same thing three times over here, right? Let, I'll just read it. A person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul wanted to be very clear. Like, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works of the law. We are not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. On and on and on he went to make very, very clear. He's like, Peter, you remember who you used to be, a Jew who was struggling and striving to, to be faithful before God, but who constantly fell short. We weren't good enough. We were separated from the Gentiles because they clearly weren't good enough. They were sinful too. But now when we think about our justification and what this word means is uh, it, 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 it governs our standing before God. It, it literally means to be declared not guilty. That, that when God looks at us, he sees our lives, he declares us, court of law, not guilty. Like we have been acquitted for our sins. That our standing before God, we now stand declared righteous instead of guilty. It's like, do you remember this, Peter? And we talked about this in Jerusalem. And yet something has happened that you have gone back to the works of the law. Peter, did you, did you think God was mad at you for, for hanging out with the Gentiles? Peter, did you lose sight of the gospel and think that you had to obey all of those laws again? Did you forget that we're now governed by a new and better covenant that has ruled the old one obsolete? And then he continues. Verse 17. But... If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? This is the, the argument you might have heard around church a little bit when you were younger, right? Um, it's where you didn't want to hang out with the wrong people because you might be guilty by association. The, the, the concern would have been that when the circumcision party came into the church at Galatia, Peter, they might think that you're like, the Gentiles. They might think that you're living a life of revelry and sinfulness rather than living your life in worship to God. That might be the concern. But then Paul answers that with maybe the most um, strong condemnation of a statement that you could utter in the Greek language. It is meganoita. He says, may that never be. And then he, he reminds them. He says, for if I rebuild what I tore down, so in Jesus Christ, we said the law wasn't good enough. The law couldn't save us, right? The law only convicted us of sin. So we tore down the law, and instead we came to faith in Christ that we might be justified by his work and not by ours under the law. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. He's like, Peter, why are you rebuilding the law? And you're just demonstrating your sin. Peter, you were eating with the Gentiles at Antioch, and then you separated yourself. Like, you stand condemned by your own actions. You prove yourself to be a transgressor. Now, you can decide which side of that you were sinning on. Were you sinning by eating with the Gentiles, or are you sinning now by refusing to fellowship with them? Either way, you are sinful. 
But then he reminds them of something that we all need to be reminded of over and over and over. In verse 19, he said, For through the law I died to the law. No longer governed by the law, I died to that. So that I might live to God. So that my life might be offered to God instead. No longer governed by the law, but now I live according to, to God, that I might worship Him. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Paul's like, Peter, the way that we have been called to live is not a returning back to the bondage of our old way of life. It's not by returning to the law. God, am I, am I doing good enough before you? Man, am I attending church enough, God? Am I giving enough tithe? God, am I acceptable to you because of my works? Paul's like, hey, don't, don't rebuild what you tore down. Man, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We are declared not guilty by by virtue of his sacrifice and his perfect life, which has been credited to our account. Like, don't return and relate to God and other people in that way. But instead, remember that you were crucified with Christ. Like, you died to that old person that you were, and you have been raised up, we see this pictured in baptism, to live a new life, no longer in the the strength of your flesh, but now in the power of God's Spirit. Christ now lives in us. Peter, you reverted to your old identity, and people started to get hurt. And you started clinging to those old traditions that you were raised with that have no gospel value whatsoever. And maybe this is a point in the sermon where we ought to start talking about us. Anyone else ever experienced churches or people who are very well-meaning But they've reverted to something other than the gospel and said, if you're going to be acceptable before God, if you're going to be accepted even in this church maybe, and you you got to have a little more than just faith in Jesus. Anyone ever been there? Maybe for you, you were raised in, in a church that said it's Jesus plus the King James Bible. And if you're not reading from the 1611 true word of God, you're not really walking with Jesus, right? That was the that was the implication. You weren't acceptable in the church because you weren't adhering to their old tradition. That's what Peter was doing to the people at Antioch. By the way, the Bible is written written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was not written in the King's English in 1611, right? And you just wonder, how do people around the world worship correctly? They don't have the King's English in the, the Latin or in, in the Spanish version or whatever, right? Like, it's foolish. It's traditions of men. And it is antithetical to the gospel. Maybe it wasn't the King James Bible. Maybe it was a Baptist hymnal and a piano and an organ. And if you dared listen to or sing anything else, any of those praise choruses to God, uh, you were deemed lesser, right? You were a compromiser. You weren't really there living the way you needed to. Or maybe you were raised in a church that said if you didn't speak in tongues, then you didn't have the full gospel yet. That you hadn't really been filled with the Spirit That you were somehow lacking in your faith and you just needed to trust God and pray for that. And then you could have what everybody else in the church has and you'll be complete in Christ. Listen, we need to be reminded over and over and over and over of our new identity in Jesus Christ. Christ. We're no longer Jews. We're no longer Gentiles. We're no longer slaves nor free. No, none of those other worldly labels now govern us because we are now in Christ Jesus. We put all of those other things aside and the one thing that governs our acceptability to God is the work of Jesus Christ and our faith in him. The gospel isn't something that we merely believe. It's not the jumping off point that now I'm a Christian and I'm good. The gospel is something that has to inform our every single day. It informs our very identity for who we are in Christ. Uh, Isn't it interesting that the Apostle Peter, he'd been put in prison for refusing to preach the gospel. Like He'd endured quite a bit of suffering in defense of the gospel. But then when some men from the circumcision party came in 
he withdrew and compromised the gospel. Do you know why? Fear. He was afraid of what people might think of him. He was afraid people might think he was a sinner. Or they might think he was a compromiser of some sort. He was afraid. So he withdrew. And listen, hypocrisy was costly back then just like it is now. Um, the first thing, we've already talked about it, um, in Peter's hypocrisy, he stood condemned. It became apparent to everyone that Peter had sinned in one way or another. He had either sinned by separating himself from the Gentiles or he'd sinned by uh, communing with them and eating their food before. Like, where are you, Peter? But other people were also affected. And we see this in verse 13. It says, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter. Peter was an apostle. He was a leader. And he'd been put in a position by God to lead people toward him. And instead, he led people away. The rest of the Jews, now there's a rift in the church at Antioch between Jews and Gentiles where they don't hang out together anymore. His hypocrisy was costly. And it went beyond even the Jews. It spread even to Barnabas, who was the companion of of Paul, who was also there in Jerusalem, clarifying what the gospel was. Barnabas joined them in their hypocrisy. And then in the final consequence we see is that those Gentiles at Antioch, it says in, in verse 14, it says they were forced to live like Jews. These men and women who had had no life in Judaism, who didn't understand any of that way of life, who were set free in Jesus Christ, who previously would have been called sinners. I mean, they, they would have, people would have walked past them and turned their noses up. The Jews wouldn't have anything to do with them. They were never welcome to come into the temple to worship because they were unclean. You know what Peter said to them again? He's like, ah, oh, yeah, you're unclean. Yeah, you're unfit. Unless you live like a Jew... We can't have fellowship with you. Peter, in forgetting who he was in Christ and the freedom that he had in the gospel from the Old Testament law, he actually reminded the Gentile sinners and called them back to their old identity as well. Anyone ever, ever been there? Anyone ever feel like you're not worthy to worship because the enemy, the accuser, is right there reminding you of your past Reminding you of what you've done, the person that you've been, the people that you've hurt. Maybe you feel called to serve God in his church. And the, but the enemy, he's right there like, who are you to serve? You know where you've been. You know what you've done. And listen, the Gentiles at Antioch and all, they lived it up, y'all. It was pretty overt. They openly worshipped other gods. And Peter, through his hypocrisy, he was reminding them of how unfit they were. He was reminding them of their former lives, that they were Gentile sinners and how they didn't deserve to come to God. Rather than living out and exemplifying the gospel, which says the standard of our acceptance before God, the reason that we're declared not righteous is not on the basis of our works, our lack of sin, our, our good enough life before God, but on the work of Jesus Christ and our faith in Him alone, what Peter was saying is, listen, I get that you come to faith in Jesus, but you're still a Gentile sinner. I still can't have anything to do with you hypocrisy has consequences in church we have to be so careful I was a youth pastor for a lot of years and one of the things that was so profound in the homes of the students that I that I had was hypocrisy it was the the, the families who might proclaim the gospel on Sundays but fail to live it out the rest of the week they failed to remind their kids of that, that, that they were accepted in Jesus Christ by faith in him alone. And they failed to demonstrate a life of worship to him. Like the Apostle Paul tells us that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are crucified with him. And it's us, no longer us who live. It's not my desires and my preferences and I just kind of go along with my life however I want. But rather it should be Christ living within us. We're not governed by the law, but we're governed by the Holy Spirit of God who transforms us and begins to live a new life through us. 
Can I just tell you, parents, your children need to see this new life lived through you. They don't need a bunch of rules where, you know, like when I was a kid, it was like, as long as you didn't um, smoke and drink and chew, you are probably okay. You know what I mean? Like, you were all right in the church. How you lived otherwise didn't matter. Oh, and you could not dance. I'm, I was raised Baptist, y'all. You couldn't dance. Jesus has called us, the holy God has called us to a relationship with him where we live in his holiness, where Christ lives within us. And we are free from sin, we're free from the law, but we are still faithful to God through the power of his spirit who is at work within us. The life I live, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me. And gave himself up for me. Our motivation for righteous living, it's not law. It's not because we fear God. It's not fear that God's going to reject us. Uh, The reason that we would live righteous lives is because Jesus Christ loved us. And he gave himself up for us. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance and invites us to live a life of worship before him, not compelled by fear of what other people will think, not compelled by fear that God might reject us, but compelled instead by God's love for him and for other people. We live lives righteously before him. The gospel is not our ticket that gets our foot in the door of Christianity. It is the thing that should inform every facet of our lives. Our marriages, we ask, how am I picturing the gospel in in my marriage? As a husband, am I laying down my my life for my wife? As a parent, like am I here, am am I serving as Jesus Christ has served me? Am I giving myself up for my family as Jesus did for me in my workplace? It's not, are they paying me fair enough? Are the rules good enough? It is, am I coming and worshiping God in this place and exemplifying Jesus Christ to a world that needs to see? The gospel should inform every facet of our lives. It should inform our identity we ought to be the most secure people in the world who are never give way to fear we're not worried about what people are going to think about us we're not worried about making sure we have to you know hit all the right marks in order to be acceptable in our society we don't have to worry about being successful or a failure we don't have to worry about you know our future and if everything's going to be okay and if we're going to live up to something and we don't have to worry about our past because we are in Christ Christ now lives within us us. Church, we have to be careful not to fall into hypocrisy. And there in verse 21, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And we don't want to nullify the grace of God or at least portray that with the way that we live. And we want to be people that share the gospel, the hope that we have, not just with the words that we speak, but the lives that we live. And we ought to be the most free people in the world. We ought to be the most accepting and loving people in the world. Not that we don't have standards, but what we're not doing is pointing people back to law. We're pointing people toward Jesus Christ who transforms our lives, who transforms our hearts. So today I have just a few things that I want you to consider um, as you think about your life and, and your understanding of the gospel. Have you come to the place, first thing, have you come to the place where, where you would say your identity is that you are found in him? That you have been clothed in his righteousness? That you're living out the identity that the old you has died and that a new creation that has come and now Christ lives within you? When you think about yourself, are you living out this new identity in him? Or are you doing like Peter, living out of that old identity? Are you pained and held back by the weight of your past? And is the weight of other people's expectations governing your life? Maybe it's something somebody said about you, a label they placed on you years and years and years ago, and that's not who you are anymore, but it's still governing your life. Maybe today as we close this service and we have a time of invitation, you just need to bow your head and say, God, would you help me to see that in you I am the righteousness of Christ God, help me to see that I have a new identity. You've given me a new name. Like I'm a new person in you because of the gospel. Not because I was good enough, but simply because I received your free gift of forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe for you, 
you've never believed the gospel. That you were saved by grace alone through faith alone. And you've been working really hard and you're just exhausted because you can't be good enough. Weeks where you're doing well, you, th- you think, oh man, I'm killing it. You know, God must be approving of me. But then when you, you fail and you hit a rough patch, you think God, you know, is going to bring judgment down upon you. Maybe today you need to receive the gospel that where you stop looking at your works and you start looking at his. And you stop trusting in your ability to be good enough and you trust in his perfect righteousness. He fulfilled all of the laws perfectly. You will never improve upon that. And through faith, you believe the gospel and begin to live this out in your life. And then finally, some of you have been saved by faith, but you haven't been living by it. And you've been like Peter. And you've known something inwardly, but you haven't been portraying it outwardly. And rather than exemplifying the gospel in your life, you're running the same race that everyone around you is. And you're, you're fighting to find your worth in your job or in your fatherhood or motherhood in your accomplishments, in your wealth, in the praise of men. Maybe you're living a life in fear of man and you couldn't dare speak the gospel for fear of what people might think of you. Maybe today is the day where you say, God, I recognize that the calling of a believer is to be crucified with Christ, that I would no longer live, but you would live through me. And you just invite God to have his way in your life, to do whatever it takes that you might die to the old person that you were and now live for Christ Jesus. Would you bow with me today? Father, we thank you for the gospel that not only saves us, but the gospel that heals us, the gospel that transforms us, the gospel that informs every facet of our lives. May we be people who can say, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Father, I pray that Cross Community Church would be a people who have been set free from fear, who have been set free from insecurity, who have been set free from our sin and now live in the freedom of your grace, who are so moved by your love for us and your sacrifice for us that we can't help but praise you and live lives of worshipful obedience before you. Father, we pray this in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation now, and I'm just going to invite you to respond in obedience to him. As I said before, maybe you just need to bow and pray right where you are.